Eric, I'd like a Star Trek trivia from you, please, if you have one. <laughs> I do. And I should have done this um, as a, um, I should have done this on our last one as a kickoff for season two. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't think, I didn't think Charter Stone was worthy of it. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Here's a good, here's a good one. Here's a good trivia one. Right. This is one of the longer ones. When an alien probe was brought aboard the, brought aboard the Enterprise <clears throat> and a beam knocked Captain Picard unconscious in the inner light, it caused him to live 42 years as an entirely different person. The probe contained the history and memories of an entire race, doomed as their son went Nova. Spoilers, by, by the way. Yeah, this uh, is huge spoilers right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a problem with spoilers on things that are like 20 years old, honestly. <laughs> It, that's on you. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, technically, all all, all trivia questions are spoilers. That's true. Once yeah. you get the answers right, so go go and watch the Inner Light. That's a, the amazing best episode. episode of TNG, anyways, and then come back. Yeah, or you and can just we'll skip ahead twenty trivia. seconds. I suppose that's another option. <laughs> right. The probe survived, seeking the transfer, uh, seeking the transfer, seeking to transfer the memories of an entire people to one person who would remember and tell their story. In under a half hour, Picard lived a lifetime as Common, the Iron Weaver, shown at left with his daughter right in the picture. After he saw the probe launch from his world, he was gently drawn back to reality as the probe completed its transfer. After his ordeal, the crew inspected the probe and found a box, which they gave to Picard. What was in the box? I can tell you without the multiple choice. One second. Fire truck. Insultingly simple. You done, Eric? Here's what you should do. Spunky. Here is a good strategy. Go here and get wheat. Okay. Spunky. Welcome to a piece of the action. I'm Micah. I'm Eric. And I'm Greg. And today we're going to be looking at the estates. Came out in 2018 by Klaus. Is it Zoch or Zoch? Z O C H? I think it's Zoch. I actually it's German, so I would guess. But... I mean, Klaus sounds German. I don't know if he's German, but Klaus sounds German. Yeah, I, think, so I, I would think, guess Zoch. I think it's Zoch, um, but I, I, I'm 90% sure. Right. Uh, so, kind of a newer game, too, compared to some of the ones we've done. Um, and two to five players, 40 to 60 minutes. So uh, unlike last week when we looked at Charterstone, where I had played the Legacy game with you guys and I knew all about it, this game I have absolutely no idea about at all. So uh, I'm very interested to learn all about it. So we're going to get into it right away. We'll go ahead and start with you, Greg. Maybe you can uh, give us a little breakdown of uh, sort of the premise and a little brief overview of the rules or how you play the estates. Sure. Uh, the premise is we are investment firms, basically trying to build up a new community. Of We're basically building up new buildings. Uh, so the game at its core is three rows. And each of these rows has, I think, four, four plots starts with. Um, and you're building buildings onto these plots. Um, there's blocks, six different colors, and they have values on them that go one through six. Uh, buildings are built by stacking these blocks on top of these plots, and the, build, the blocks go on top of each other. The numbers have to go in descending row. Um, and the color at the top of the stack determines the color that owns that building. And the players own different parts of that, different colors. Uh, the way the points are scored at the end is you just count up, you sum up the entire total of points in that whole building, and that's how many points you get. Uh, the, the big twist in this game is the game finishes when two of those rows are complete. So all four buildings are there. That can change. I'll get to that second. Uh, and there's a roof on top. Uh, that means the building is complete. So when two of those rows are complete, the game ends. You get that many points. However, that means there's an incomplete row. Those all score negative points for you. 
So you lose points for any buildings that didn't, didn't get completed in that row. Uh, and that's kind of the, the key twist, I think. So the other part of this game, though, is the auction side. So this is really an auction game at its heart. Uh, all of these floors, these roofs, there's also these special tiles that get auctioned. It's a once-around auction. Uh, the person who put the thing up for auction gets the last bid on it, and they basically can either pay the highest bidder the amount of money they said or have the highest bidder pay them that amount of money. And that determines who gets to place that block or that roof. Uh, there's also these special tokens. For example, there's some permits that allow you to extend the rows out longer or short. So they need less or they need more buildings to complete. There's a mayor hat that basically doubles the results of a row, which could be negative or positive. Uh, and that's basically the whole game in a nutshell. It's pretty simplistic rules. There's a little bit more to it, but I think we'll touch on some of that as we talk about other things. Okay, very good. Um, so with so with that explanation, now I realize I did play this game. I just did not remember the name of it because we played it when we finished. Charter I was wondering. I was I was going to say something. I, yeah, and I was like, did didn't Micah play this game? But I, no, but no, I, I did. I, I did. I just I think you you guys you pulled it out so fast after you were so eager to move on from Charterstone last time <laughs> that that uh, I didn't catch the name of the game we were playing. But now that you say that, it's like, oh, okay. This I, eh, I thought you did, but then I thought to myself, you know what? I rarely remember Micah being in our games. So yeah. It, that is a good I, point. That's, that's I not. rarely remember Micah being in your games. So. Even if he wins. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even if he wins, I'm like, wait, did nobody win that game last time? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just, it's just my memory fades into blackness. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, Eric, how do you feel like the Estates does when it comes to executing on the little theme that it's got going there? So I'm going to say something that you're probably going to hear me say a few times in this review, and that is that this is a... It is surprisingly good at its theme for its its scale its size it, it does it does a lot of things pretty good dis, despite being a pretty compact game there's actually as greg mentioned there's not a ton of things to do per turn but all the things that you can do they have a really high impact on the game so if you make a bad call much like in real life you can mess up the rest of of your game and um you know in writing this especially this section on, on the theme, I started to get a little um, uh, public service announcement-y. So, <laughs> so here's, here's, my, here's, we'll my, bear with here's my, here's my big meta, my meta theory on, on uh, this type of game in general or games in general. So one of, one of the scary things in life, people, is how important every little decision can be. So, and I think that that is a really important thing for young people to, to learn. They can benefit from coming to that realization that, that one, one little thing can change the trajectory of their entire life. And I personally am a firm believer that games can be good training for, for life. So I've talked before in some of our previous videos about how uh, Go and um, games like Bridge are really good at stuff like that. They're excellent games for uh, for what sociologists call um, calibration, being well calibrated, knowing what you can and can't do. I think games like Estates and, dare I say, Food Chain Magnate, uh, I think those yeah. are good games for learning about consequences. So even though um, I'm, I'm speaking from a little bit of um, ignorance here because I've never been an investor in property development, though I have worked around that industry for many years. And so from my admittedly naive position, I think this game captures the main components of that, that field and more importantly, the risk that is inherent in that kind of work. And those are that speaks to how well this game gets its theme despite being a small game. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, you know, talking about that because I, I think about trying to tie the play of the game to um, to the theme, that aspect of it where the rows that are partially built count against you, right? Um, I can kind of... Uh, it isn't immediately obvious what that would represent in the real world, um, but you can sort of come up with a little story for it that mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you could say that like, well, maybe buildings get built and then the city changes their codes and all the buildings that were under construction can't be built. And it's a negative well, and I don't, or something. I but. don't think that like, ha I don't think that you need 
to have um, completely isometric connections between, you know, we've talked about this before. Right, one to one. Be, right, uh, a one to one ratio of of uh, of um, analogy in the game. Mm-hmm. I mean that that would be immersive, <laughs> but I think mm-hmm. a game can also get there by by reproducing the lessons learned and the and the the feel of the, the primary feelings that you get when investing in something as big and as important as a construction project. And I think that, that this game gets that. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. So, um, so speaking about feel, uh, going back to talking in more uh, terms of within the context of board games and other games you played, uh, open it up to both of you guys. How did this game feel to play? Uh, maybe Eric, you want to continue? Uh, in terms think of what, it, what type it, of game it, it feels very, like yeah it was very it's very tense it's very tense but it's um i'm going to talk a little bit more about this later but it's very understandable and so um th- there is a it's like your first couple of games will probably feel a little um trial and error like you mm-hmm. don't know what what's important you don't know where uh what to put up for auction because that's really the primary your primary action space in this game is what do i put up for auction when it's my turn also how much do i bid on this thing that somebody else has put up for auction those are really your two the 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 two things that you need to decide and at first you're not going to know what that is but um but as the game unfolds you feel like you're getting a, a more a better and better grasp on the the levers that are in that are in the game, and um, I think it, I know this isn't exactly what Greg means when he says what the feel of the game is, but for me, it, it feels satisfying to uh, to play this game. Okay, uh, Greg, what do you think? How does it feel to play the estates? Yeah, well, just to touch on the theme thing, actually, before we move on, sure, uh, because you know we talk about this a lot, but there's uh, one of my favorite theme articles is by uh, Martin G, or Cordy Martin on BGG. He talks about different types of themes. He talks about theme as a mechanic, and that is where the mechanisms themselves kind of tie to real-world actions. Mm-hmm. But then he talks about theme as a dynamic, mm-hmm. where it's, it's quite abstracted away from the real-life going-ons of real estate development, but it still feels similar to what it feels to be in real estate development. Yeah, it, it simulates the risk and it simulates that the, the tension of that probably goes on, the competitiveness that probably goes on in that market. So I, I think it's an emotional landscape. Yeah. So I yeah. think it has, this works very well as theme as dynamic mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to theme as mechanic. Um, but I, I think that ties right into the field of play. Um, I think Eric was pretty spot on uh, when he talks about uh, it's what I call it, it's what I've mentioned before as being a volatile game. Like it's so easy for things to shift around. Uh, so, th- and for the entire, your entire goal to just change on a whim from another player, uh, because he's right. Every little, cha- every little decision that's made just butterflies out to being pretty chaotic. So yeah, it, it's a volatile game. Uh, it is pretty cutthroat. I'd say it's chaotic. I mean, because of all that, every decision kind of feels important. Um, I think cutthroat is usually the word that people usually come up with first when they describe this game. Uh, on top of that, it's a light medium game, I would say. It's really easy to to learn. The rules are fairly simple. Though I just say I would say the decision space, uh, you get a lot more from that uh, than might seem from the simple rules. But yeah. That's okay. Do you, how it feels. do you think that it um have you I'm not sure if you played it enough to have an opinion on this yet. Um do you feel like because of its sort of chaotic all over the place nature? that because we've talked before about these games having sometimes having ba- baked in strategies right yeah. uh do you think that uh are you familiar enough with it to have an opinion on whether you think oh that I, I have a very strategies yeah. emerge i have a very definitive opinion on this but we got to get to the good and bad section. okay all right <laughs> well all right for that Now we're going to talk about the strategies uh, and priorities that a new player might want to keep in mind coming into a game of the estates. Uh, Greg, why don't you start us off with those? Is any game that's this volatile and chaotic, it's difficult to say this is the strategy you should go with because uh, we'll come back to this point, but 
because it's so chaotic, I, you know, you could, you could do the, you could do a lot of things and still lose, <laughs> but these are just some, I think principles to go in with that I think uh, maybe are not obvious the first time you play. Maybe. And the first one I want to talk about is low value blocks are actually more than seems. I think in the, when you first go and go, okay, I want, I want a lot of points. So I'll get the six, but because the building is the color of the top floor, as soon as you put that six down, someone's going to build on top of it and take your six points and it's no longer your building. So when you're looking at the landscape of these blocks, because there's very little randomness in this game, you see what blocks are coming up for auction. Um, and you know, and you, you, whoever builds the first uh, floor of a color gets that color. So you can look at the blocks in advance and see, okay, which, which blocks are coming out when, what numbers are coming out. And I would say prize those lower values higher because it's much easier to put those on top of higher value floors and still a building. Uh, in, in connection with that, I also say highly value the single high plots. There's certain plots in the game. There's three. There's one in each row that can only be one floor high. Uh, and those are pretty sweet because then you can get a high value block, plop it there, and you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the game, aside from making sure it ends up in a completed row. So that, that's kind of nice um, if you do want to play some high value blocks. Uh, the third thing I think new players should watch out for is to be careful about running out of money. Um, because this is a closed economy game, right? The game, the money, new money does not come in and money mostly just shifts between the players. Players can, uh, we didn't talk about this rule, but players can embezzle money at the beginning of their turn. They can stuff a buck uh, under the board. And that just goes as points at the end of the game. And that's taking money out of the economy. That's the only way money leaves the economy. So you get yourself stuck in a position where you just spend all your money. And if you're at zero money in this game, it's really difficult to come back from that. Uh, you have no power to bid on anything. And I think that happens because every bid seems so important in this game that you end up bidding, overbidding on something. And then you realize that the next bid is equally important. <laughs> now you don't have any money to spend. So be a little conservative there. Don't, don't run out of money. Uh, just understand that other really important bids are yet to come. So I, I, I just be a little conservative. All right. Okay, very good. Eric, uh, what about you, strats and priorities? I think this is where our, our tactic in this, um, in a piece of the action is good, where we're not giving direct strategies. We're focusing more on like, here's what's important in the game. I think it's really valuable, especially to new players and especially in games like this that, are, that can be so volatile because it's, it's not about, here's what you should do. Here is a good strategy. It's more about how can you find a good strategy for you in this game because the strategies are going to change. So I think kind of echoing a little bit of what Greg had to say that there are two really important questions that you need to have answers to. Um, one is who has the most money or really what is the distribution of money? Like it's also important to know if somebody has not a lot of money because their bidding power is is small at that point and the second question that you want to answer is what color are the ones and the twos so uh yeah greg is right the the small numbers are more important because those are the finishing numbers and the the last die that is placed on a building that's who owns the entire building so getting those small numbers on top, of, on top of buildings is really important. So once you've answered those two questions, who has the most money or wh what's the distribution of the money and, and who's uh, the, the ones and the twos that are going to be coming, uh, that are, because you can see all the dice that are gonna be available in the game. What color are those? What company, what player owns that, uh, that color? I feel if you've if you've got those two questions down, because this is ultimately a bidding a bidding game. So in any bidding game, the most important variables are who has the most bidding power, and what are the most valuable things to bid on. So that that answers both of those questions. Also, don't forget to ask that question of yourself: What are your most important um, dice like, that, that you'll be bidding on, um, and 
And how much money do you have? How much bidding power do you have? Once you have that information, you can begin attempting to time your actions appropriately. And the timing of when you offer a particular valuable dice on auction, that's the key to winning the game. So there are other things that you can bid on other than, than dice, but I think that their importance is really only in relation to the dice, to the buildings. So after a few plays, their value should start to make sense to you. And so obviously you want to bid on your own important dice when you have the most money and you want other people to bid on their most important dice when they have the least amount of money. So that's just a general thing to keep in mind. Um, and when the timing of those things can happen is going to vary depending on the chaos of the game. Eric talking there made me think of one more thing that I didn't put it in my list because I, well, I, I tend to play a lot of economic games, but I think if you're not an economic game player, this might be something you overlook. This isn't a game where you're trying to make the most money per se or the most points. This is a game where you're trying to make more points than everyone else. <laughs> and I know that sounds the same thing, but it's a, there's a very dis, there's a clear distinction there to me anyways. Um, affecting other players is equally as good as improving yourself, right? I mean, you're just looking to be one point higher than everyone else. And this game often ends with very low scores. Even negative scores, it can end, really. So it's it's just, you know, making sure that you're uh, be equally as interested in everyone else's point values as you are in your own. Because if you can knock everyone else down, you're good. You don't need to worry about, you know, a five-point swing, downswing for everyone else is a five-point upswing for you, right? So that, that's something else to keep in mind. Yeah, there's also a, it, it would be too lengthy to go into, but there's a whole way of All right, let's go ahead and move on now to the good and the bad. What did the estates do well and what did it do not so well? Um, Eric, why don't you start out with what you liked about the estates? Well, like I said before, I think the amount of game that, it, that is in such a tiny package is really impressive. Uh, there's a, a few things that, in my opinion, really stand out. It has, it has to, to begin, it has all the main components of a big game, like City of the Big Shoulders or Power Grid. Uh, with much less danger of one player losing interest because of being in last place. And, but I'll get back to that more in a little bit. The next thing it does well is it has what Greg likes to call emergent gameplay, which effectively means that the strategies develop out of the rule set but are not rules themselves. So uh, it just makes for a really, really beautiful, um, a beautiful game in the, in the mechanics sense. It's also not bad to look at. It's, it's small. But I really like all the, everything is a component. Everything is a piece. So Greg talked about how um, there's like a mayor uh, token or uh, there's a way to, uh, there's a contract that can extend the, the, the length of the street that you need to fill up. All of those things are pieces that you can, can bid on. So everything is kind of chunky and understandable. Um, that's another thing that I really like about it is that the game state is very easy to comprehend at a glance but it's not insultingly simple. And finally, one of the things that stands out most to me is uh, the interaction in this game. Like a lot of economic games, the, the amount of player and player interaction is very high, which is always a uh, thumbs up from me. And then um, going back to that, that first point about a, one player poss possibly losing interest because the being in last place, that does exist because this is a mean game. This game is actually all about being mean, um, as in, not that, not that you feel compelled to be mean to other players, but good choices for you are inherently bad for other players. So, um, and as, as I mentioned before, one bad choice can, can lose you the game. But in a game that's this short, that is not as potent a problem as in, say, Food Chain Magnate where a bad choice on turn one locks you into a bad experience for three to four hours. So because of that, uh, it's able to keep its, its hard edge without pushing new players away. Do you think, um, it reminds me, I was going to ask this, do you think that 40 to 60 minute runtime is accurate that it shows on BGG? I do, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, good to keep in mind. Greg, what did you like about the estates? Yeah, so these are a lot of the values I always promote in games are in this game. Um, I, I should list these out. There's like four or five I always come back to and just like say how many points each game covers. But it's cutthroat, right? Volatile, super interactive, 
It's emergent. Uh, these are all things that look for in-game. It's missing one, which I'll come back to, uh, but for the most part, it's hitting a lot of the key points that I like in a game. And Eric mentioned this, but it's doing it in a short period of time. The 45-minute game, I, I mean, I know this is not everyone's definition, but I consider this a filler. <laughs> this is my, you know, anything under an hour to me is a filler. So it's, it's, there's not many games of this length that I think has all of those things going on together. It, it's just full of really tough decisions. The whole game, every decision matters, and I love that in a game. Uh, it said it's, it's volatile and it's, it's cutthroat. It's super confrontational. It's interactive. Every decision you make affects the board. Again, these are things that I want in a game, and this is doing it. Uh, you know, games can end in negative points. I love that. Um, there's so many ways that you can affect the plans of others, right? You can just, you, there's never a point. I mean, as long as you got money to bid with, and even if you don't have money sometimes, you can find ways to really interact with others and, and mess up their plans. Um, I do like closed economies. I'm always a big fan of that because if you have, if you really want some uh, item, you got to spend a lot of money, which of course is hurting you, but you're also helping someone else because you have to give that money to someone. So, you know, there, every, every action you do has a consequence someplace else. And I almost feel like that's like the design philosophy behind this game. It's like, how can we make sure that every decision is affecting someone else? that I make. Whatever I'm making for myself, it's also affecting someone else. Um, because of that, because I, you asked the question before, yeah, yes, I, don't, I think it's emergent. Um, I don't think there's any baked-in strategy. I think this is the exact opposite of that. Um, it's not clear as to what you're going to be doing until you get into it, and every game's different. And I also think strategies kind of reveal themselves over multiple games, uh, which I like. There's a lot of things where I, I, I'll realize, I love games that I get little epiphanies in the middle of the game and go, wait a minute, I could do this. And this changes things. Just as a very off the top of my head example here, uh, you know, one of the recent games we played, I, one of the rows got so extended that it became obvious that this was going to be the row that didn't get complete. And I remember when that happened, I was thinking, oh, well, that's probably going to make the game less interesting because now I know exactly what row is not going to be finished. But then I realized, oh, man, you can really badger people with this row because now when their floor goes up for auction, they don't want you putting in that row because they know it's going to be negative now. So this row, even though it's obvious which one's not getting complete, is still having a massive effect on the game. So you can now I can just dangle this as, as, as bait. You know, it, it, it's just there's just so many things that open up. There's never a point in the game uh, where I think, oh, I'm locked into a certain strategy. There's always some new way to approach the same problem. And I like that. It's, it's, it, and it's due because of that, because of that emergency. I think it's, it, it's hard to play. imagine this game ever like being a dud, you know? Um, so if you don't like it, that's one thing. But like, there's never going to be a game of this where, it, where there's not interesting and exciting choices to make. All right, very nice. So let's go to the other side then. Greg, what do you think the estates could have done better? What did you not like? Okay, so again, as usual, my bad. Um, let me start with some... Just things that you should be aware of that I don't particularly think are negative. It's actually just touching the point that Eric just said, actually, uh, about you can never get into a position where it can be a dud. I actually don't know I agree with that. Um, I think as usual with volatile games, especially games with a closed economy, I think people can get into positions that are not fun for them. Uh, if they're not watching how they're spending their money, if they're not watching what they're doing with their stuff, I do believe newer players can get into a position where it's like, oh, okay, I just messed myself up and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I, I, think, I, I think that's possible. So that's something going in knowing that you, you could do that with some bad decisions. Um, there's usually a way out of it though in this game. I don't think it's as harsh as like Food Chain in that regard. I do think there's typically a way out of it, but you can uh, mess up the game <laughs> really sometimes. And actually that's another thing too, because it's so intertwined, uh, the way other players play can really throw the balance of the game out. Um, so you have to go in knowing it's just that kind of game. Uh, and that that's kind of leads into the next point that some people, um, Eric did say this, that some people are just not going to enjoy it. I think some people are just not going to get this game uh, conceptually. Um, I think some people are going to come to this game and they're just going to be like, I don't know why this blue five is more important than this purple four, because it does require a bit out of the player. That's one of the results of not having, an, having a game that has baked in strategies. The game is not making it obvious. Go here and get wheat. You know, it doesn't say that. It doesn't tell you how to win. 
So it does require something from the players to really read the board. I think it's really easy to read in this game, but it does require them to actually put that effort into it to understand why this auction is so important. I, I do believe you, you could get some players that just don't, don't want to read that far, and then they're just like lost the whole game. That can happen. Uh, so just make sure you have the right group for it. Getting into things that are a little bit more not my style. Um, the game is not random. I've already said that the only place where there's random is the roofs, the roofs that you flip over, but that's really mild. But it is chaotic. It's a big difference there to me. Random is coming when it comes from the game, chaos is when it comes from the players. Um, in fact, it's so chaotic that if you look in the rules and a lot of strategy places online or the forums online, people will recommend you play multiple games of this to kind of smooth that out. Because uh, one game can just mess you up and it, not through your own fault. So it, it, it makes it really, this game is actually also because it's so chaotic, it's near impossible to read more than a move or two out. Uh, it, 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 you just can't do it. And that makes the game very tactical. And now, and remember I said that there was, this was missing one of the features that I really like in games. I like games that are much more heavy on the strategy side. This game is not strategic for the most part. You can like look at the cubes and get a basic idea of the colors you want to go for. But I would say this is like 90, 95% tactical, this game. You just do the best move as it comes up. Maybe think a little bit down the line. Um, so that, that, that diminishes it just slightly for me. Um, it's doing everything else so well, though. I'm willing to overlook that. Uh, last one, I'll just throw in a component issue. Um, it is, they have these cubes, Eric kept calling them dice, the, the floors. Uh, they put the value on the top, which me makes it really difficult to read the values that are in a building sometimes. You have to like, you're always constantly having like look under blocks in this game to see what values are in a building. I don't know why they didn't put the numbers on the side to make that easier. That's one little issue. And I would have the same issue with the little single plot. Remember I said there's one, uh, one in each row, just, you can only go one floor high which are dirt patches. But once you put a cube on top of it, you, don't, you no longer see that. I just kind of wish there was something a little more telling. So it does a pretty good job of keeping its information visible, but those are kind of crucial sometimes. And I've seen people actually make mistakes, bid on a uh, block they didn't want, really, because <laughs> they thought they could put it on top of a single plot block. And now they end up winning this auction they didn't really want. So I have seen it actually affect gameplay. So that's it. Those are, those are my bad. You know what they could have done? I just thought about this. They could have put, because uh, I was thinking the only reason they wouldn't have put the numbers on the side is for the aesthetic of making it look like a building. But they could have di done different uh, values of windows. So like pips, they could have put windows on the side and made it yeah. look kind of artistic. But and then you count, the side, you count the windows per side and that's the number on the top. Part, part of it is the side is actually a pattern. And that's actually, I know why they're doing I that. the top I, was the pattern. I thought it was a top. And no, the, there's the, only one number and the number's on top. Every, right. The other four sides are a pattern. I know, but then I thought the pattern was behind the number on the top. I didn't think it was on the no, sides. No, it's on the sides. Know. So okay. the reason why those patterns exist, which I commend the game for, I didn't mention this in the good, but if they put it there for color blindness purposes. Yeah, so it's every, really hard to see though. <laughs> uh, each, each color has a different pattern on the side. I, I thought, you know, a lot of games don't even acknowledge that I actually thing. expected you to bring that up because it's about, I thought it was about as hard to see as the designs on the crew. Oh, really? Which you had a problem with. Oh, I didn't have any or near issue with this one. I, I thought. Interesting. I don't know. I mean, I'm not colorblind. So have I, you played it with I'm, your dad? I'm, I'm never, no. <laughs> I'm never <laughs> speaking from experience on this, but I mean, I, at least there's a pattern on the side that's supposed to be there for colorblindness purposes. How that actually works, I can't speak to. But the fact that they actually put some thought into it, I thought was good. But, I mean, I think that's why they don't do other things on the side. But I still think they could have fit a number in there or dots or something on the side. Yeah, it doesn't feel like those, like some color blindness feature and some sort of indicator, like those have to be mutually exclusive. No, right? and that's, but, again, that's the point. Just, yeah. yeah, it feels a little like a missed opportunity there. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, Eric, what about you? What did you not like about the estates? Well, it's always discouraging when my my opinions of things lined up with Greg, but I just assume that he that is, is unfortunate. slowly poisoning me with some oh kind goodness. of... I, 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 I want I to I I go back to my bad section, change all these points. <laughs> suddenly, I'm not feeling confident about them. No, but I like strategy in things. And 
while the estates is not completely devoid of long-term planning, it is relatively unimportant because of the potentially gonzo crazy things that each of your opponents can do. And that's not to say that the game is only about waiting for people to make mistakes, but I, I'm, I kind of likened it to Jenga. Jenga's rules, very, very simple. But the game state is so different each time it comes back to you that you really just need to make the best move you can in the moment. So that's the main thing. I also, this is not the game's fault. This is just a matter of personal preference, but the estates falls into filler game category for me. And I just prefer big, long, crunchy games. But that's not really fair because like, it kind of cuts both ways because as I mentioned in the good section, that's one of its strengths as well. That's the reason why you can have a game that it is that is as cutthroat as this that's not going to ruin the night for one person because it'll only ruin you know an hour <laughs> that's actually <laughs> a really good point to play it again that's actually a good point i didn't bring up but it is a mean game and i think it gets called a cutthroat game a lot but it never feels spiteful like i'm never upset it's, it's over you so know fast. i mean it, yeah. i think because it goes so fast and because there's so much of it like you can't make a decision that doesn't affect mm -hmm. people so if you if you're worried about it being like cruel i don't think it ever feels that way it's not cruel it's no ticket to ride <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the epitome of cruelness the family game <laughs> the ride. epitome of cruel games <laughs> but um but yeah there but it is a filler and i just prefer prefer bigger stuff but it, that's it that's a a good thing for it as well so then on a related note I would say that this is one of those filler games that it might be hard to find the right time to play it because it's long for a filler. And this is just, I don't know if either of you guys feel this way. This is just me, maybe. But it's not big enough to be the main event. And while I enjoy it very much, just me personally, I wouldn't want to play an evening of the estates. I wouldn't want to play three or four games of it in a row, probably. I mean, maybe depending on how I feel. But so I, I, I like a game that's going to be big four to six hours, you know, an event. Um, but the, the estates is long enough to make it so that if you pull out the estates and it lasts an hour, maybe a little longer if you're playing it for the first time, that means that you won't have time for that bigger game left over. And so that's just something to bear in mind. It's not like, it's not like the crew where you can just pull it out and like play one or two missions and then pack it away when everybody gets there. It's more involved than that. So it's, I am done. I have one more bad. I, I realized that my uh, list went to page two and I didn't scroll down far enough. <laughs> And this is actually a pretty big one, so I want to I want to I want to go back to this. Um, again, this is not bad for, for me, but I think it's definitely something worth noting because it kind of is sometimes to me. But I'm over to willing to overlook this because it's such a short game. Uh, you have to be okay with not winning a game through no fault of your own. I think that's actually something that's in this game. It's it's so chaotic that you can really make really great decisions, and just through the way the game shakes out you just lose um because every decision is so swingy that really anyone can just win uh honestly a, a new person coming in and, and win this game no problem i think just because it's so swingy it's not random but because of that chaos that can happen now i'm okay with that with a game this short but um if that bothers you if you if you just want to be like this epitome of strategy in games just just know you could make a lot of great decisions and still lose maybe that means you should have made better decisions i don't know but but it, i i do think the the best player will not necessarily always win this game so just i think that's worth noting yeah that is an interesting thing we've talked about it a lot we kind of danced around the subject in previous reviews but like uh it's not random it's not a die roll to just to determine things but it may as well be because everybody's decisions you know i felt like puerto rico had that that um quality too uh where it was like everything is so finely balanced that like, you know, it's the, it's the Jenga thing. Like one, one person pulls out one stick and then the whole thing starts to wobble. And now, you know, you can't, you can't, um, maybe there's no good move on the board, you know, on, on, on the tower. So it's like that can happen to somebody, even if you're playing really well. What is, it reminds me of the, that, uh, the card quote that everybody quotes all the time where he says to Wesley, right. About that's possible to, 
was it? Well, I'll find a clip of it. This it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. Something like it's possible to do everything perfectly and still lose, and that's life. Let's go ahead and go on to our final thoughts on the estates. We want to know what do you rate the estates? Uh, would you recommend it and under what circumstances? And where does it fall on our shelves? Does it go on our 10 game shelf? Does it go to our 25 game shelf or does it go nowhere? Let's start with you, Eric. Okay. Uh, yeah. So final thoughts. This is what I've got written down. It says, due to its genre as a filler and my tendency to suck at economic games, this game had an uphill battle in trying to win me over, but it succeeded with style. So I really enjoyed this game. I actually would recommend this game for anyone who wants a challenging and immersive economic filler. And even if, this, even if that doesn't sound like it's your cup of tea, give it a shot. It's not going to take up well, actually, now that I'm looking at it, maybe it will take up a lot of space on your shelf. It's a bigger box than it needs to be, does isn't it? Maybe that is. Yeah, it's a, it's not quite ticket to ride size box. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, oops. even though the board the board is like you know just like a it's a the board's tiny. Small. There's a lot of blocks in there. Um, there is, but it, blocks, it, yeah. it doesn't have to be that big. In fact, well, the original the original priest I forgot the German one that actually came like a little shoebox looking thing. Yeah, that's a problem because of of. Uh, what do they call that shelf um, shelf appeal or shelf like how much real estate it's taking up? Yeah, it, it doesn't <laughs> take up more than it needs to. Yeah, but it's it's a really good game. I would recommend it to to anybody, even if uh, maybe especially to people who don't think they're into economic games. I'm not particularly good at them. Um, I've you know um, doing doing this uh, this YouTube show and having to force myself to play uh, play more. All of games those that games outside of my likes. wheelhouse. <laughs> yes, uh, I have softened on them, uh, and, uh, but this is a really good entry point to economic games. So, is the game engaging? My pop song category, I give it two stars. Uh, are people's turns interesting? The bathroom category, I also give it two stars. Does it give me lots of choices? The what if category, two stars. Uh, can I feel awesome in it? The high five category. Mm. It succeeds, but barely. I give it one star. And then is the game attractive? The picture category. Again, it's not going to blow your mind, but I give it one star in that too. So overall, what is that? Eight out of 10. Right. And uh, what do you think about the shelf? I would like to have it on even the 10 game shelf. I think it's that. I think it's good enough to go on our 10. Okay. So I don't know then. if you want me to say what I would suggest for kicking off until after Greg's given his. Yeah, let's uh, let's so that that negotiation then will be pending here until we hear from Greg. So, Greg, uh, what about you? What do you rate it? You recommend it? Okay, this time next year, Eric's favorite game is going to be 1830. He's softening on these. <laughs> are you uh, are you predicting that because of all the things you're putting in my coffee? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Slowly working you there. Uh, yeah, I like this game. Uh, it, I I kind of have similar feelings with Eric when it comes to fillers. And again, you know, mind you, my definition of filler is longer than most people's definition of filler. Um, but yeah, anything under an hour to me is considered a filler. But I, so it's really difficult for a filler to really stand out to me. But I think this is this would probably be my top ten fillers of all time list per my definition um, because it does hit so many things that I enjoy. I um, oh no no. So if I have the, basically, if I have the right group of people who I think like this kind of games and it's cutthroat and at the end of a night of another economic game uh, and I, hey, we got our hour to play, this is a great game for me to pull out. Um, and, and it's because of that, it being interactive, uh, it, it's so uh, just volatile, like all those things I mentioned before. So I, I like this as a filler. So I give it an eight. I match Eric on this one. Uh, this is right at the bottom of my tier of what I want to play this game uh, on my own. If I could just pick the right group, and I, and I would. Yeah, if, if, if I could just have any group, I would willingly play this game and recommend it. So it's an eight. Does it go on the shelf? Uh, I like it. I guess I want to hear what Eric's suggestion is about kicking something out. 
So I really enjoyed this game. I, I think my over time I might cool on it a little more, but right now it I I'm really enjoying it. So currently I think it's it's good enough to replace, and I know what you're gonna say, but I think it's good enough to replace Ticket to Ride. And Ticket to Ride, I feel, has a similar, well, I, I think it's actually Ticket to Ride is lighter, but I feel like the 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 number of rules that you need to know to play the estates is roughly the same. I think it's much more engaging than Ticket to Ride. And even though there's there's meanness in both, I feel just for some reason, I feel more offended when it happens to me in Ticket to Ride than it does when it happens to me in the estates. And it's both about building things. It's both they're, they're both both games are about like um, kind of in in a in a kind of odd way, in an unusual way. They the feel of the game is kind of similar in that uh, one in one you're building lines of trains, and in the other you're building um, towers of of of. of blocks of dice kind of so i feel that there is enough similarity there to merit at least looking at getting rid of ticket to ride okay well unlike eric i see zero similarities between this and ticket to ride i think i think they're <laughs> completely different games for completely different i'm groups. not saying that they are i'm not i'm not saying that there's a ton of similarities i'm saying there's enough well for me it's like the reason why i I, like ticket to ride i think that there's i know i know and that the vibe of the vibe of the estates is it does some of the same things like emotionally you know like aesthetically not not in mechanics but as you know emotionally it 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 takes me on that same journey just just to be clear i think i i do like the estates better than i like ticket to ride but the only reason, and, and you, know, you know, I'm going to say this, but the only reason I like keeping Ticket to Ride on is we have complete newbies over at the house and who've never played games before. Ticket to Ride is a billion times easier to teach than the estates in my sure. mind. Yeah, I think well, the estates. I, I think yeah. the, the estates would overwhelm brand new players. And I, you know, but here's the deal. I mean, we have. I know you want to get rid of this Ticket to Ride eventually. We have code names and the crew. I think both of those work with newer groups, even though I think they're small games. And I like Ticket to Ride because it feels more like. A game game that you pull up with new players. If you really want to kick off Ticket to Ride for the estates, because I do like the estates, I'm willing to let it happen. I like it better, and I know part of the reason for having the shelf is like having a wide variety of things that you can play. But there needs to be balance between that and playing stuff that we really enjoy, you know. And if you well, like sure, but I estates, enjoy Ticket to Ride, and you don't. So yeah, and I and I don't. I understand that that is different. Yeah. Uh, I do. I do agree almost just simply based on um name the the power of its name everybody knows ticket to ride you know and so people will be like "Ooh, i want to play ticket to ride i get that all the time um and i'm like do you do you really want to play ticket to ride (laughs) but there's a there's an appeal to the to the the ip you know and um so based on that why i'm saying that is people are going to be excited to play Ticket to Ride much more than they would be to play the Estates. So that having been said, it, it, it does fill that slot better than the Estates would fill it as far, sure. as, far as like a brand new newbie group. Yeah, um, I mean, but... If you're I, not I, willing, I, I'm willing to be talked out of that and just get rid of it on, uh, on the 25. I guess my, my thing is with... Um... I mean, the 25 is a different conversation, but it, it for me, it's a, uh, yeah, I mean, I honestly, it's got to go eventually. I know you don't like it. So, and I, I'm just, I, I can be convinced that, hey, you got a new group over, pull up code names with a crew. You know, those I'm, I'm fine certainly with fit that. Yeah, those do. Th- certainly those those are for much. new groups too. Um, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I was going to recommend the crew if you're going to kick mm. something off, just because, even that's our only co op. I just don't need co-op on my list, even though I like the crew too. That was going to be my recommendation, but just yeah. to stop hearing you okay. complain about it. Interesting. Almost, I would be so. I don't. I think the crew. The reason I wouldn't want to kick the crew off is because even though the estates is a filler, it's one of those the crew long is more fillers. Filler. No, I get it. I the get crew it. Is, is better in that position. Well, we're in a tough spot. The ten game list. It's really hard to kick anything. It is. Right it's now. hard. But uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's optimistic. Come. I think it's optimistic, Greg, for you to think that just because he kicks it off, he's going to stop complaining about it. 
<laughs> at least I can stop hearing about it. Yeah, if seconds. this is about uh, your capacity to listen to me whine about Ticket to Ride. Don't Binge do about. No worries. <laughs> You want to kick it off a second time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so what? What are you? All right. So, well, so what happens to Giga Ride? You go away completely, or does it drop down to the twenty-five game show? No, they're they're completely. I'm I'm worried this 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 uh, concept is confusing the people. Then maybe we, we should not do the twenty-five game show. No, they are completely separate shelves. Mm-hmm. Independent. No decision we make on the ten game shelf has anything to do with the twenty-five game shelf. They're okay. completely independent. So Ticket or I goes away. Now we move on to the 25 game shelf. And we, which uh, also has a copy of Ticket to Ride on it. Yeah, which we could kick off, but there's a lot more choices to kick off. So we probably won't. Sure. Okay. So on the 25 game shelf, what do you want to do? So on the 25 game shelf, there's a ton of games I'm willing to kick off <laughs> for this. Yeah. Uh, the one that just, just to get rid of anything that I rate below a six, my first would be near and far. It's because I did not. That was one that, that came game. up. Yeah, I thought about that. Um, that'd be my first pick, uh, but I could be convinced in a lot of the other ones. So I'd like to hear what Eric says. But near and far yeah. from my pick. Okay, uh, interesting. Is that the lowest one on your list? On the that's the lowest. Show? That was my lowest rank, rated game. That's currently okay. on the twenty-five game show. What did you give Carcassonne? It's not much higher. I could kick off Carcassonne. Yeah. So it yeah, I was looking I at Carcassonne, um, even King of Tokyo. Although King of Tokyo does something that. Yeah, I kind of like None having King of Tokyo do. on here for now, just because it plays differently than all these other games. I really had a problem with Terraforming Mars, but I don't think... I don't know. What, what would you say about Terraforming Mars? I, I, I kind of want to keep that for now. I mean, the only ones that I like... Because I didn't dislike Terraforming Mars as much as you did. So Yeah, I would, I would I'm totally fine with Near and Far. Not to, just all right, to well, let's kick off extend near this far. conversation and, to... to yeah, by the way, everyone, if you're listening, you don't know what the heck we're talking about, there'll be links in the description that leads to our... Yeah. list on BGG yeah. and, I'm, and, our, and I'm showing yeah. give us, give us your, your thoughts okay. on yeah that has our current games. what we recommend if you can only have 10 games and you match up with our taste or if you only have 25 games and match up with our taste these are the recommendations from all the games we have reviewed up to this point correct and uh, so so we're saying goodbye to Ticket to Ride from the 10 game shelf and we're saying goodbye to Near and Far from the 25 game shelf uh, we'll see. So, so Eric, so you still have the t- the Herculean task ahead of you of getting Ticket to Ride off of the twenty five game. Show. I can con- I can continue to pound it in right. the months and years to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we look forward to that. Um, so, uh, if you are in the mood for a cutthroat, volatile, emergent, mean filler, and you haven't tried the estates, then check it out. Um, comes very. Highly recommended by our professional reviewers here. So what uh, are you guys going to be playing next? Do you have any idea? No, I don't know. <laughs> we didn't really that. discuss that. Do, we I, didn't really I, discuss I keep, that. I keep throwing out Sidereal Confluence. Yeah, I, I do. I, I've played that a few times, but I need to play it a little bit more before. Yeah, I I'd like to play it at least one more time. So that's definitely on the block. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but uh, that was uh, one of the games that was recommended, was it not, from our... Yeah, that was when those put on our geek list, which, by the way, we should mention that, too. We have a geek list. We'll be in the description that if you want us to review something, go there and either put it on the list or thumb up a game that's already there. Set your confluence with one of those. Antiquity's on there also, and I, you know, if I can get a hold of Eric to play that, that could be an option. I'd like, I'd like to play that. Yeah, and also, I like I, I said last time, but Great Zimbabwe is coming in soon, which I would like to review eventually. I'd like to venture review all the splatters. But anyways, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll be a surprise. Okay. All right. So we're giving ourselves a little bit of uh, wiggle room there, but all three of those games will be coming soon. Uh, until then, uh, check out our geek list on uh, Board Game Geek. Uh, we'll put the link in the description. Uh, subscribe to us if you have not, especially if you like uh, hearing these types of long discussions uh, about board games where we can really spend time digging into them. And uh, until then, this has been a piece of the action. Okay, so I I go ahead, go ahead and uh, and tell me. And, and you have to be. So the reason I want you to guess now, Greg, mm-hmm. is because while you would get it if I listed off all the all the options, mm-hmm. it is actually quite specific. Okay, I'll try. I'll try. Okay, but this isn't my answer until I hear the four. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's is it Rekison Rekison flute. Oh, that's that's really good. I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. <laughs>
It's close. It's that's not it. No. Nope. The options are A, his tools, B, a wedding ring, C, Rescian flute, a Resican, Resican flute, Resican, or D, a sash. So obviously, Micah, that gives it away yeah. for you. Yeah. No, I knew it was a flute. I didn't remember the the Resican because yeah. because he, he still plays it later, right? He does, and actually, it's one of the few times that we get a continuous um, storyline. And I think yeah. it comes back two times mm-hmm. because yeah. it comes back when he um, it comes back when he is also a very very good episode the one with the the like the geologist the alien geologist yeah was that, was like that a kind of falls for le- lessons or something like that I think it's called lessons it's yeah, a, yeah it's, right. a, it's a callback to that yeah and he plays and, and the one movie. other time but I think that might have been. I can't remember now. That was that. A, it might have been one of the movies that he played the flute. I, I can't remember. Yeah. Great episode, though. Yeah, I think yeah. that's. I think uh, Patrick Stewart actually kept that flute, like for, because of. Oh yeah. He liked yeah. he liked that episode so much too. So that's one of those. That that's where Star Trek is at its best when it, especially to a kid watching it for the first time, it just like blows your mind. You know, it's like yeah. a to- totally new new vistas open up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it makes me think of the, um, it's similar to the, do you remember the Deep Space Nine episode where they took uh, O'Brien down? Oh, yeah, and tortured him forever. <laughs> and and they, they, it was the same thing. It's the same thing, basically, like they, they forced him to live however long, yeah. what, 30 years in a prison camp, but he was, it was half an hour or something. Yeah, so yeah. Like the, the evil side of that technology. I feel like he didn't, I feel like he didn't get messed up enough from that. that was- no, well, neither did Picard, really. I mean, they never. He was, right. you think you think he just lived his entire life away from the Enterprise, he would forget yeah. some Ensign's name somewhere, but he didn't. Sure. He seemed yeah. completely okay, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like it would have been pretty traumatic either way. But I mean, at least for uh, for that episode, he was living a fairly good life. Yeah. But mm-hmm. with, with O'Brien, he was literally being tortured in a well, prison camp, you know? To be fair, he was being tortured virtually every episode on DS9. <laughs> right. O'Brien was fun to pick on for the writers, I think. Um, he's just used to it (laughs) he's just used to it (laughs) yeah um well the way you asked that question i don't know how we're gonna break it up into yeah i was i was i was was just thinking it since i uh kind of spoiled it But it's uh but it's okay i'll break it up in a really weird awkward way and uh perfect and Mm -hmm. so so thanks greg thank you 